so excited to have Mark join, join us too. For those of you, I'm sure everyone here will know about Mark and Sandy. But Mark, if you don't mind, would you mind introducing your relationship with Sandy and how long you have known each other as mm. well as what was your initial reaction when you heard that Sandy will be doing an NFT project? Okay, well, thank you, Audrey. Thank you, TR Labs. Um, I think this is a great um, new foray into um, what this technology can do. So Sandy and I, as, he, as Sandy mentioned, um, it, we're talking about the 80s here. So we, we're not exactly sure how long ago the 80s were, but they were very long ago. And um, so we have been working together. Um, I'm, I'm the owner of the Pace Gallery. And um, Sandy and I um, started working together, you know, whatever we said, 30 plus years ago. Um, and uh, the, the, the nature of our kind of um, interest was, um, I mean, my interest, of course, was to, to be part of what Sandy was doing at the Calder Foundation which was to try and figure out a new way to um, really um, promote and manage and spread the um, legacy of his grandfather's work um, to the maximum number of people uh, that he could. Uh, you know, in, in the history of the 20th century, uh, these kinds of um, foundations and artist legacy work was all about um, communicating with a very small group. Um, it was about communicating with a few tastemakers and very wealthy collectors and a couple of museum curators. And that was, that was your community. Um, I think Sandy recognized, and I did too, um, in the 90s, really, that... Um, the community we needed to reach was much bigger than that, um, that it was made up mostly of people who were not going to be wealthy enough to be collectors. Um, and that, you know, the we, we started to see um, that art was starting to move past art history, affecting art history to affecting history. And, um, you know, that passion the passion that drives it is the passion that other people understand, you know, a revelation that you've had. And that means if that's your goal, that means you're looking for every new way to connect. And I think that's what I'll let you speak, Sandy. That's probably what led you to the fantastic, innovative folks at TR Labs to think of yet a new way to spread the word. I, uh, well, you know, when Mark and I have actually been talking about the blockchain for about eight years and the possibility of doing a Calder thing on the blockchain. And I, I was always frustrated because it was always, a, it always came back to being purely really a financial thing. Yeah. Right. And that didn't really interest me. And when the NFT thing broke, now let's call it three years ago for argument's sake uh we've been we've had probably 12 or 14 serious proposals about calder nfts of which none of them made any sense to me because they were purely financial and they were all based on the idea that you take pre-existing art and you make a digital representation of it and you try and offload it onto people and that was so not interesting to us and then um my first real conversation with Audrey and her co-founder Sin Lee were Sin Lee Cohen. Now, um, th that conversation in Miami was really extraordinary because they were sincerely interested in having a um, a new community come in and explore Calder and learn about Calder, and not this kind of corrupt insider system the phony build community quote unquote stuff, but real build community like. Let's do something where it can be free. You don't have to buy an NFT and you can go through the whole program not having to buy an NFT and you don't have to pay anything for it. All you have to do is have a wallet. So there's you know, some minimal cost. 
And that was such such a such a kind of a relief to me because um, and and then the next step was how do you make NFTs that are not digital representations of pre-existing art? And that became very exciting. We just announced that Raul Marx has been our collaborator on these first five NFTs. And damn, the guy is so smart. I had no idea that he was going to be able, I, you know, I, I knew his work. I knew about him. He's an award winner, blah, blah, blah. He's, he's a good guy, da, da, da. But I didn't realize that he would understand when I talked about the nature of the universe, not the universe, not the spheres, meaning the planets and the orbits, but really what's the underlying force of the universal. Raul knew exactly what I was talking about. And that was totally amazing to me. And he made these visual uh, experiences that are... Um, this connection between those essential elements and movements that then turn into a Calder mobile and even turn out back into the universal or the universe or something else. And I was, it was kind of shocking, right? Audrey, I mean, we, we had no idea it was going to end up being so amazing. Totally amazing. I thought they were going to be really good and more than just a 15 year old dystopian view of the, you know, of the of earth, like so much of that NFT stuff is about that. It was something more dynamic, uh, was really a surprise. I mean, uh, Mark, I had the, I had the, the luck to sit in with conversations with Sandy and Raul where Sandy really was, they were getting so deep into what, non-space means in Calder's work and also how Sandy had this phrase that I reused many times and because I really love it the idea of getting inside a sculpture in a way that has never been done before in a way that is only enabled by technology but I fully agree with Sandy I had no idea that the artworks were going to turn out like this and I remember when I first got to see them even I, I first got to see them on my phone on a very small screen and it definitely wasn't the the experience that I then had later on when I were able when I was able to see the artwork on a big screen with headphones. Mark, I know that you saw two of these artworks on Tuesday and I'm very curious to hear your initial reaction and if you have any thoughts around it. Um well I I I loved it. I couldn't. I couldn't quite pick which one I wanted more. Um, but luckily, thanks to your um, your system and the way you're thinking of this, no one has to choose. So, um, you know, as far as the artwork is concerned, you know, it's been it's been decades of Sandy, and I'm 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 happy and proud to have been part of it. Um, you know, helping the scales fall from the eyes um, of people uh, who are experiencing Calder. Um, I think that it takes, you know, active um, looking uh, at Calder. I think that he was the first artist that demanded, uh, made a demand of the viewer, um, of the experiencer, I should say. Um and the translation into um, that digital form, um, you know, I thought was spectacular. I thought that, you know, a calder is made up of wire and metal and all the space it occupies, or I'll say it a different way, all the space it could potentially occupy or impact. And that is what Raul um was able to get at with his work, um, which I think is something Sandy's always wanted to see. Uh, you know, it, 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 of course, reminded me of some of the early um, Herbert Matter, you know, multi, multiple exposure photographs from, when are those from, Sandy? 1939, we dated. Yes. It could be as early as 38. So, so I mean, even b back in 1938, there were people trying to elucidate um, with technology what Calder was reaching for. Um, and, 
and this is definitely um, this has gone beyond uh, obviously anything anything we've we've ever seen before. I love that you bring that up, Mark, because there were there are so many photo- you know all the great photographers photographed Calder in his work in his lifetime. I mean, hundreds of famous famous photographers photographed him. You know, from you know even the fat, Irving Penn, like everybody. But so many people tried to create an image, two-dimensional image, of what the impact of a Calder mobile is or was to them. And, of course, they always fail. The yes. Herbert Matter ones are some of the most interesting ones because they're so dynamic. They create that, that you know, space scape that right. we can't understand, like, as emotional humans. We don't understand what it is we're perceiving when we're in front of a mobile and experiencing a mobile in a, in a real way in real time. But I, I love what you said about, um, you know, going back to the beginning of Calder's life, uh, you know, in his career, like the, the real time experience is something that you can't explain. You have to experience it in a museum or, you know, luckily in a gallery or someplace. I mean, you did an amazing show of the early period of Calder through the mobiles, describing what was the birth of the mobile in 1932. By the way, the additions, Audrey, the additions of the NFTs are 32. I think that's really cool that you chose 1932, birth of the mobile as the edition size. I know you had like, I know there's like this standard edition size of 50 in the NFT space, but I, I love that you chose 32, by the way. Um, but I, I think like the next, uh, one of the next seasons or um, periods in your educational experience that's coming up is about the wire sculpture. And that's figurative sculpture drawn in space with a wire, like a, a commercial wire, like not an art material, but a wire for, you know, construction, like an industrial material. And Calder decided that there was a way to make a drawing, a three-dimensional drawing, just with the lines, just like the energetic lines, and define a person or a figure or an animal in these lines. Now today, every school kid makes wire sculpture and we don't realize there's an origin to the wire sculpture in Calder that he invented an entire artistic medium. He did it for like four years. And I, I think of it as like Picasso's blue period, right? That great early period in Picasso that became so impressive and important that he kind of had this breakout moment and Calder makes wire sculpture and basically shuns everything that his famous sculptor father and his, and his famous sculptor grandfather had made with bronze and marble and all this solid stuff like clay, all solid material. He kicks it down the road. He just gets rid of it. He just tosses it out and makes volumetric spaces that are defined by lines. But the thing about them is you can't really, also like a mobile, you can't really understand the wire sculptures because they vibrate. And if you don't experience the vibration, the slight trembling of those wire sculptures, which are trembling like a human, trembling, like, you know, when we're asleep, our bodies are still trembling, still moving. And the wire sculptures move. And Calder was trying to get at what is that life force? What is that essential nature of everything, the universal force? And then he became abstract and made mobiles and so on. That still was the same subject. What is the universal force? What is this thing we're all connected to? But you can only experience it in the most meaningful way in real life, in real time. It's so hard on a screen or it's hard in a 2D photograph. Um, and so back to Raul, I think that his exploration, his experiment is highly successful because he went right to the root, you know, in our conversation. He went right to the root of the meaning of what Calder's trying to connect us to and uh, communicate about. So to me, the whole project of NFT space is an experiment for the Calder Foundation. And I just decided to stop fearing making a mistake and move forward and try and have this experiment. And then they brought on Raul and through conversation, have this experiment and just try not to control it too much, just allow it to kind of unfurl and unfold and I, I didn't art direct anything. Sometimes with a book, I get very involved with the typography and stuff. And I just stayed out of it. It was just simply conversation between me, Raul, and, and Audrey, frankly, and, and your team, who are awesome. I, I just, I can't overemphasize that this is one of the rare times that you get closer to Calder than 
than I would ever expect would happen. I, I think that Sandy, that was so beautifully put. And I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I have been watching and rewatching the works that Raul put, uh, that Raul art directed and collaborated with the foundation on. And I think it's really amazing how close you feel to the essence of Colors Works without being physically present with them. I also want to add that I think the way that we put together the project with the foundation, I loved how we do it. I, I definitely think it's challenging. There are going to be collectors who only want to collect and don't want to spend time learning. But Sandy, if you could share a little bit more of the audience that you would want to reach through the project and why we designed it so that we are truly rewarding those who are going through a pretty intensive educational experience to then have priority access to Raul and Calder Foundation's artworks, as well as other rewards to the foundation. Would love to hear a bit more about that. Well, I, uh, I, I love to use the term disrupt. Uh, I, it, it's, it's so key, you know, Silicon Valley made that term so popular um, and we kind of understand it, it doesn't just have a negative connotation. It has kind of a neutral connotation, um, an, an entity that comes in and changes how we experience something. And Calder was essentially a disruptor. He busted up these old notions of what sculpture could be and how we would experience art, all art, not just sculpture. And that became something that was really a guiding principle in our collaboration, like the, the, this kind of old system, meaning two years old, uh, idea of community building, I, I just found it to be kind of, kind of fake. Like this idea of, well, we're building a community, da, 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 you know, forward thinking people. And it ended up really being almost entirely financial. And that was really dis disappointing to me. So coming into it and disrupting that system and saying, uh, we want to engage super smart 22 year olds who have no idea who Calder is or maybe heard of him or whatever. You know, it's funny. I, it, whenever I give a Calder tour, I, I check in with my audience. And when it's a young audience of grad students or something, I say, who here has ever heard of Bob Dylan? And, uh, you know, and some of them raise their hand. Most don't. And then I say, and, and can, can you name a song by Bob Dylan? Or can you tell me who Bob Dylan was? And no one ever is able to tell me anything much about Bob Dylan. And it, Bob Dylan was such a superstar in my parents' generation. And I'm really interested to see how that degrades pretty rapidly over a few decades. Of course, you Google Bob Dylan, you discover he's you know, a monstrous superstar. Um, but if you, if you just talk to 22-year-olds, you, you find out that they're living an entirely different life than is my experience. So I became really, really interested in my, you know, in really decades of exploring um, highly intelligent youth and how to engage them in Calder and how to have them realize how relevant Calder is to the present day. So in my discussion with you, Audrey, and with Sin, I, I quickly realized that we had a chance to come into this community in, um, in a kind of, I don't know, I would call it an elegant way because it's, it's giving a proposal. The proposal is, would you like to learn and for free about this artist in a way that has a relevance to you and your experience today? And so, um, and it's not just about somebody in Sydney, Australia or in Hong Kong or in or in Omaha, Nebraska, buying an NFT and hoping for it to go up in value and then selling it. You know, it had nothing to do with that. Um, it really sidesteps that whole thing. At the beginning, Calder was dealing with motion and people before Calder had dealt or tried to deal with the issue of motion and they were trying to depict motion. The cubists were depicting images of different aspects of a subject and showing like a lineage of time in a two-dimensional representation of that time. Calder sidestepped it 
and just made actual time as part of the work of art. As Mark said before, the space that it occupies, but also the time in which it unfurls are key ingredients. So actually the media of Calder's artwork, without that space and time, there is no artwork. A static mobile is not a work of art. A static mobile is just a pile of metal with some paint on it. It's not the work of art. The work of art only exists in activity, in real time. And sharing that with people, um, especially this super smart, um, and I don't even mean like they're college educated. I just mean like people that are realizing that the blockchain is part of our communal future. Like it's part of the evolution of humanity in some aspect. We still have really no idea how it's going to, um, how the future will be created with blockchain, um, with digital coin, with all those things, all those different questions with NFT, all these different things are really, really fascinating. I also became personally quite fascinated by how the digital image, which is native to the NFT, is uh, really striking and totally different than a mu historical museum uh, you know, opening up a flat file, taking out some old prints and photographing them and calling those NFTs, which I find pretty hellacious. Um, really digitally native NFTs are quite interesting. It's really, um, it becomes experiential in a way that Calder's dealing with. So, so you can see my kind of fascination with, with all of that. I, I guess, Audrey, you want me to talk also about, um, we want to honor the people that are out there and grasping what it is we're doing and participating with what it is we're doing and so besides the possibility to buy an NFT, blah, 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 which, you know, buy them or don't buy them, it's up to you. We also want to, um, you know, give, this was your idea that, that we should like give gifts, like a signed book or um, Calder made some amazing stamps for the U.S. Postal Service. And in, 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 I mean, he didn't make them, but they were way after he was dead. And on his centennial in 19, uh, 1998, is that what I know? Yeah. 1998, yeah. Um, the Postal Service made these sheets of stamps, and we have some of those sheets at the Calder Foundation. So we decided, let's give these to people who are engaged with our program, and you know things like that. Beyond that, super super rare um, chance to come to the Roxbury Studio, which is not a public place. I mean, very very few people have ever seen this studio in its home in Roxbury, Connecticut, where it's still so vitally energetic. It still kept the way it was when he was alive. All of his materials are there. His tools are there. The house still has all of my grandparents' things. My, you know, Louisa's kitchen's full of her stuff. Uh, my grandfather's handkerchiefs are still in his drawer. You know, all of it is there. It's very, very energetic, very incredible. Um, so sharing that with somebody is, you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be a special day. Audrey, I hope you're going to be there. I, I wouldn't. I will fly across the world to be there. And it's it's just such a special place with so much it's almost magic. I couldn't I could not describe it any other way. But going back a little bit, Sandy, I really loved what you were saying about Calder Foundation being a disruptor coming into the space and in thinking about engaging with a new generation of collectors and art enthusiasts of just young people in general. And Mark, I would love to have your thoughts here too. I know Pace Verso and Pace have been very much so a disruptor that's been leading and leading the traditional art world and coming into this new space. Would love to hear about your thoughts on how you're thinking about this next generation and Pace Verso in general. Well, <clears throat> I think Sandy said some really important things, and thank you, Audrey, for the plug for Pace Verso. We always love that. Um, so, I mean, in our world, that traditional art world, we have a very complex, like, matrix of experiences. On one end, it's wealthy people creating collections which, by the way, eventually make their ways to museums. On the other end, there are those museum experiences. There are the gallery experiences. There are things to see and do as well as things to buy. And in the NFT Web3 community and, and the, 
the early NFT artists always decry this, you know, things have moved strongly towards it's about something to buy, that Web3 is all about ownership. And, you know, those of us who are really in the art world, who are really interested in the possibilities of Web3 get nervous if it's only about owning something because our art world if it had if it had only been about owning something the art would have no value the art has value because millions of people value it not because the hundreds of people who own it value it and our society's relationship to art is experiential from cave paintings to the Sistine Chapel to whatever uh, you know example you want to give so you know, our Web3, you know, excitement about Web3, which is the same excitement, is the excitement about reaching people, about using new technologies to reach them in a better way. But it has to be about experience as well as about collecting, as well as about, you know, you know, people having sharing opinions and arguing about things. Um but if we don't innovate that, that experiential space of the NFT, it's going to stop being interesting really fast. And at, at, at Pace Verso, you know, when they said, was this your NFT platform? We're like, no, this is our, you know, this is our team to try and understand what the potential of Web3 is to do what we do, which is certainly sell art, but it's, a hundred other things as well. So I think it's taken till now. I think you guys are, you know, at least as far as I know, one of the first people to really use the blockchain experientially. And, you know, that's something obviously we at Pace are uh, extremely interested in and have been for the last 10 years, um, or I should say since the, you know, since the 60s. Um, and I think, I'd just like to say one more thing, which it's, it's, it, it couldn't be more appropriate that this is Calder. Because Calder is the artist who revolutionized our relationship to art that brought the art into our lives and the, our lives into the art. And there is no performance artist or installation artist or experiential digital artist who doesn't owe a debt to Calder pulling that art off the wall and off the pedestal and off a static clock and into our three to four dimensional universe. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. It's funny because you, you, um, you bring up the digital artists and a, a lot of these artists don't even know their debt to Calder. It's just part of the psyche in a way. Uh, I think that's also um, one of the things the Calder Foundation was excited about was sharing that this guy in the 1920s and the 1930s was looking to a future today. And that's kind of shocking. I mean, the fact that he was able to get famous in his day is, is remarkable. I mean, it's difficult for artists we always hear about the famous artists, but we don't hear about the unfamous, the, you know, the millions of artists who didn't make it. Um, the fact that Calder became famous was for a lot of reasons, besides the fact that he's a great artist. That, that's only like 50% of the job. There have to be so many other components. As Mark, Mark knows full well, he can't just walk into an artist's studio, say, I'll take you on, and all of a sudden they're famous. It doesn't actually work that way. People think it works that way, but it doesn't work that way. It does but, not work that way. No, <laughs> I love that people think that, you know. I I don't, I feel like I don't know what to say because, Mark, those are such beautiful words and what a special way to describe Calder. I actually, I actually shared this at the event on Tuesday. I, I gave a speech a little bit after you left that. Oh, I'm sorry. I had sent Sandy, I had sent Sandy a video of eucalyptus that I took from the Pace exhibition in 2019 of Calder. And I said to Sandy, I felt so incredibly lucky 
and 2019, 2019 me couldn't have believed that I wouldn't have ever had the opportunity to even get to meet Sandy, nevertheless work with Calder Foundation at such a level. And I think it's, it's with people like you within the art world that are open to younger voices, new opinions and new spaces and experiences coming in that allows you know, little platforms like Tier Lab to be able to come in and experiment alongside you and saying, hey, like we don't, the NFT space is so new. We don't know the right way to do things, but let's put forward what we think could be a very interesting way to experience the blockchain, which is less focused on just NFT sales or people like to say drops, but more around a really all-encompassing experience where we are not, we're also trying to educate people about the importance of Calder for people who come in who may only know Calder's name to walk away with something a lot deeper. And for people, people like me, who I thought I knew a bit about Calder, I knew about mobiles and well, Sandy will tell you that I did not know the right way to pronounce mobiles, for example, to walk away with something much deeper. Well, Audrey, um, I, I want the whole audience to know that you're you're kind of our target audience. I mean, the well, with the exception that because your mom is such a huge Calder fan, uh, you already knew like something about Calder, which was mm -hmm. you know which was funny. Um, <laughs> but a, a lot of people ask have asked me why are you doing this now, and I think that's a great question because, as Audrey well knows, Mark doesn't even know this. We postponed this project, waiting for a moment of a rebalancing of the crypto world. And, you know, a couple months ago, there's a whole discussion about crypto winter and blah, 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 and these markets up and down and whatever. But we were waiting for the kind of the big rush to move beyond us. We were no rush ourselves. We wanted to actually enter this space in a way that was more calm and more, more of a way to present the idea this not not particularly disruptive but a little disruptive idea about how somebody can experience calder in the digital realm and by the way it also you know has an nft component i mean it, it wasn't how do we promote our nfts and get everyone to buy them that that was you know specifically not the intention and we, we have the great luxury to be in a position to be able to you know, not have to sell a bunch of NFTs, which is not, not the case for all of the different artist foundations. We're very, very fortunate. But I think the rebalancing of the moment is something that can't be overstated because it, it means that people now have this, there's, there isn't this, you know, fever to grab the NFTs because they're going to go up in value. And it, it's, we've taken the, the specific point, right? The direction, the, the kind of, the whole attitude of the thing to this educational thing. And we haven't even really described, Audrey, the educational uh, component, the educational experience. I mean, people, people literally have to read about Calder. They have to actually study the subject and then they get a test. And it's, and it's kind of brutal because you only have one chance to pass the test. It's not like you can go back and study again and then, try and pass it. You know, it's not like becoming a lawyer where you get three chances. It's, um, it's, there's just, there's just one chance to pass and to get to the next level of study, which is, um, you know, I found that really kind of interesting, Audrey, that your team designed it that way. Cause it's, it's not like, it's not just set up to be easy so that people can get to the NFTs and buy them, which someone might presume that that would be, you know, how you would roll roll this out because ultimately other people's view would be, you know, let's sell a bunch of NFTs. So it's really, it's really interesting. I mean, I think those 12 people that have already been through it, could it, we should probably do a talk with them. I'd love to do a talk with them, with some of them and see their point of view. I'd love to know their, their feedback. Yeah. I, uh, one of the collectors actually messaged me directly. Like he had previously been within the tier life community and he's, he, mess he texted me that this was something that he's never experienced before and he thought it was so cool. And uh, he actually also 
went ahead and found an Easter egg that was hidden within the study materials. So it's really, I, I think people are very interested in doing something a bit differently. And one of the things that perhaps I, I take from my mom, and you know, Mark, you know this too, but my mom is the biggest Pace fan. She, we, we, her, she always does a ton of research. <laughs> she always does a ton of research before ever even thinking about collecting or acquiring an artwork. And I think one of the things that was missing in the NFT space, and I think we, we spoke of this a bit before, with there being a focus on sales and a focus on, hey, come and buy my NFT, let me show you this artwork, is that there is less of a focal point put on the artist's practice, that you should maybe learn a bit more about who the artist is, what they've done, so that you feel a stronger connection with not just the artwork, but the artist behind the artwork. And a lot of what we want to do here is not, I think it's, it's not to cut out people who are interested in coming in to just collect the artworks, but it's more so rewarding it so that it's fair, so that people who are putting the time in and going through this pretty insane study room experience with the with a very intense quiz that's going to open on the 20th will be rewarded because they have spent time to learn about the artist rather than money. I think uh, in adding to that, Tier Lab's mission has always been to fuse NFT technology with fine art knowledge to pioneer a new way of collecting. But more and more so, Sandy, through our experience of working with you, working so closely with the foundation, I've been thinking a lot more about where education comes into play, where educating for people to come into the space, it is frankly quite difficult to get onboarded, to get a wallet and to start within the Web3 space. But it's also necessary for people who are new collectors to become educated about the art that they're interested in collecting, not just, oh my God, I bought this piece, look at it, it's so cool. But what's the meaning behind it and the story behind it as well as the artist's statements and feelings as they were putting the piece together. So I, I really do appreciate it because I think it's been, it's been such a joy for us working with the foundation to discover step-by-step -step where there's definitely been a lot of challenges posed by you to us, Sandy, of can Tier Lab figure this out? I want this to happen. This is the type of behavior that I would love to see from these young art uh, enthusiasts. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed, but I do see that there's already so much excitement around the experience that we've put together. Well, I think the, the NFT space is um, allowing us to kind of rethink about how sure collecting art but more experiencing art like how how art is part of our our daily lives how art is part of how we experience life on this beautiful earth of ours and um the communities that are coming together over at the intersection between like the digital realm and mark's father's world where people bought paintings or sculpture in a beautiful gallery space there there is a small slight intersection there in the middle and now it's expanding through these kind of experiments and that to me is really exciting that there's there are artists who are making digitally native nfts real artists right not just opportunists and there are people who are starting to collect them and uh, MoMA is exploring how they can collect NFTs, should they, how they, when, when, what, you know. Um, we're having discussions with some of the great museums of the planet about the Calder NFTs right now, because we'd like these NFTs to be in museums and be held in the museum's digital wallets. Of course, these museums don't even have digital wallets yet. So they're, you know, think about like the Metropolitan Museum in New York that, um, doesn't have great works of the 1980s, has some, has a few. It doesn't have a, you know, could use a, a big Basquiat. Same with MoMA, they could use a big Basquiat. 
Um, Basquiat's a pretty great artist and they're kind of behind the times. And I hope that they don't wait, you know, 40, 50 years to get into the NFT space. I think it's, it would be great if they started seeing that this is a cultural phenomenon and something that needs to be recognized, especially the Met. I see the Met as, you know, thousands of years of human communication um, and they should really be at the forefront instead of dragging behind, you know? Maybe Mark, you have a comment about that too. Oh, they are all dragging behind. Wake up, people. <laughs> Come on, <man. laughs> um, you know, the museums are always a little behind. Um, that's actually okay. As long as the rest of the art community, the art galleries are not lagging behind. I mean, I don't, you know, our, our colleagues are, um, you know, unfortunately, there's like fear. So what's the fear? You know, the, the people said, well, or do you want to, you know, I have so many people said, you really want to get caught having been doing this NFT thing when it co completely blows up? I'm like, uh, you don't say that to your artists. Like, you sure you want to try that ridiculous experimental idea? It could blow up. I mean, if that's what our artists, you know, did, they wouldn't be making art. Um, they'd be design committees or, you know, something like that. Um, du Buffet said the only proper condition for art is the condition of permanent revolution. So that means you're constantly have a high risk profile of what you're doing. Um, and, you know, OK, so the Met might have the lowest, <laughs> but the rest of us in the art world better crank it up or or we're going to get left behind because the conversation proceeds. And um, if you're not part of it, you're not part of it. So, well, for, uh, well, fortunately, the financial parasites have been, you know, recently washed out of the market. So it gives this wonderful moment of stability or at least this this momentary plateau of yes, it's going to do buffet. It's going to continue to be revolutionary, but there, we are at this nice equilibrium. I, I really think that this rebalancing moment has been yeah. a great time for us to enter and explore and and express the you know we don't believe this is perfect. We just believe this is kind of a. We, we kind of set it up as a challenge to the community saying, hey, this is yeah. what we think. Yeah. This is a way to use your technology in a way to engage people and to share new ideas and fresh ideas and, and, and also old ideas that can be brought into the new sphere. Um, I, I don't want Max, who's our friend, who's the director of the Met, uh, to feel maligned by us because he's, he's doing a, f a fantastic job. And I do expect that he's going to be one of the leaders in this field. He's exactly the kind of a guy who's going to um, jump forward while everybody's sort of holding and worried that they'll make a mistake. I mean, I will say the, the, the museums are ahead of the galleries here. Um, and that's been true, you know, since the rise of, you know, interactive experiential artists like Team Lab or Random International. It was the museums who took the risk. The galleries had no interest and were, um, you know, very protective. And the same is true on the NFT front. I do expect people like Max are going to be um, out front. And I think what you're doing here is going to make it a lot easier for them <laughs> to get in there. Should we be, hey, uh, Audrey, should we be, like, asking questions? I don't know. Do you do questions on Twitter? I'm just about to hit my uh, point where I turn into a pumpkin on this. <laughs> well, we, I know, I know that we did start a little bit later, but there I, has been, I've been tracking what has been coming into when it what's been coming into our community. And I actually think we have hit a lot of the points where, you know, people are very curious as to both of your reactions with, to the Calder, not just the Calder question, but the space at large and what you see moving forward. So I, I wanted to pause there and see if either of you have anything else you'd like to add there. I mean, all I'll say is that the Calder question has got a lot of our um, you know, 
fantastic people who are looking after the legacies of great artists um, at Pace, like, um, you know, Klaus Oldenburg, who sadly just passed, and Sam Gilliam, and so many of the um, great estates um, are taking very close keeping a very close eye on what happens here so um it's really important what you guys are doing and um we're all we're all going to be watching and seeing if this model can spread well i also want to thank you audrey and uh your amazing team because and sin of course uh it was pretty ballsy of you to take this different route and to see that there's a possible, I mean, when we began our discussions and when we even, you know, four or five months into this whole thing, uh, it, it was not clear we'd be where we are today. Everything was uh, susceptible to change, uh, lots of discussion, lots of discord, lots of agreement. Um, it's been an amazing process. And partly because our goals were so simple at the beginning. How do we engage a community and share with them some some challenges? Definitely. I think uh, given that we're kind of coming up to the one hour mark now, I, I mean, I have no idea how this will go, but I'm very excited and hopeful that there are going to be, there are our enthusiasts and collectors out there that agree with our approach and, you know, are not in something for the wrong reasons and are actually looking forward to something a bit new and different. Uh, Mark Ariel would kill me if I don't say this, but so I need to put it here. But there is going to be a surprise uh, for the Pace Verso Discord community with our early edge to the educational experience, which will grant participants a head start to elements of the amazing study rooms and quizzes that Sunny I've been talking about and also ensures that you have a higher chance of elig eligibility for membership rewards from the Calder Foundation. So if anyone is not on Tier Lab or Pace Versos Discord, please do join in. We'll have all the links attached on our Twitter shortly and stay tuned. Go Pace Verso! <laughs> Thank you, Audrey. Yeah. Thank you, Audrey. Yes. Uh, the last the last thing I want to add before I let both of you go is that we hope that once someone has gone through the first chapter of the Calder question, they will then become interested and experience Calder in person, potentially at a future exhibition at Pace. I will wrap up with that we really do believe that the digital and physical worlds can complement each other, and that's the promise of educational NFT experience in the fine art context. I Yesterday, I met a Tier Lab collector who has never been interested in art and came in. The first thing he ever collected was a Tier Lab NFT. And he told me that he's going to pace his event uh, on Tuesday in London because he's since then gotten much more into not just collecting NFTs, but also learning more about art in general. So I really hope that it gave me a lot of hope that those these kind of conversations that we'll be having will become a lot more widespread and that this is just the beginning. Fantastic. Great. Yes, we love the metaverse, but it needs a lot of off ramps. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Absolutely. Have a wonderful day. Mark and Sandy, and talk to you both very soon. For those who are listening, please uh, follow Tier Labs Twitter and Discord and Instagram to stay on top of everything happening with the Calder question. And join Pace Verso's Discord for a special surprise coming on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.